Okay, now we're on verse 6 in the low window. Matthew 24, verse 6. And it's really pregnant how this one works. Okay, and then atop that, in the top window, we're in Ephesians 1, 5. And I'm sorry for the way this text displays here. It doesn't display well. This is the HTM version. And you have to have BibleWorks fonts to see it. But the PDF version will be in a link in the video description, which is easier to look at. This is Eudokian. It is part of three types of... Ad, I'm not sure if they're really attic, but three types of anaphora that Paul uses throughout Ephesians. And he uses them as a sort of... Um, multiple time balance meter technique that took me 150 pages to explain and I'm still not done explaining it yet I've just reached an impasse with respect to the last of them and so this it gets really hairy in Paul at this point and it's really um, productive because it helps you see how meter was used now we had stopped at 109 AD which was there and now we're getting into the next 18 syllables which takes us to 127 so we're starting to get into the first anaphora which is the Eudokian anaphora and we're also going to get into the second anaphora which is here in between them is one of the most deft and very biting satire of the whole passage the use of the Eta here at Telematos. It's one of the three anaphoras. Actually, there's four of them. And Telematos means the will. Okay, so will and purpose, really. Okay, it has a context of formality, like a formal will and testament, a formal decree. Okay, Telematos. All right. And this word, Telematos, occurs three times in the Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 passage. And what's so astonishing about it is that at every time you have an eight the eta there in Telematos, all three times it appears in Ephesians. Each time the eta right there highlighted in black appears. That marks the death of a f yet future emperor relative to Paul. But that's not all it does. This is what's so sarcastic about it. Telematos means your will and purpose, the thing that you want when you die. You know, you're going to die, so you have your will for your heir, and you wanted to leave him behind something, and there was something you hoped to accomplish with your life. Okay, but see, at the Ada, you're dying before your will is complete. This is how deft Greek satire is. Okay, at least Paul's. Telematos is the whole word. But you're dying in the middle of it, so your will does not get completed. Paul uses the same kind of sarcasm with respect to Constantine. Okay, so it's really, you know, deft. All right? The Emperor Trajan dies right there, 117 A.D. Atele. The E. The Ada. His successor is Hadrian. And if you know any Spanish, this is hysterical. Matas. The rest of the word, the rest of his will, the rest of Trajan's will is not completed by Trajan. Trajan's will does not get done. The successor undoes everything the predecessor accomplished. That's a major Bible doctrine from Genesis to Revelation. Man makes his plans and then God overturns them. And Paul is saying all that simply with the Ada. Now he does it three times in this passage. He does it here for Trajan at 117. He does it again later on, which we'll not get to in this video, for Macrinus, okay, around 211 or 17 or something. 
Macrinus killed Caracalla, and then Macrinus gets killed by the Severan mothers getting hiring somebody to do it. So Macrinus's will got undone by being killed because he killed the son of the Severans. Okay, and then the third and final time that the Eta is used for a future Roman emperor whose will does not get completed is for Diocletian. Now, T.D. Barnes made this big stink about saying that Diocletian died earlier than everybody else. Well, no, the traditional scholarship is that Diocletian died in 316 A.D., and the Bible confirms that. And the guy who came after him was Constantine, and he undid every single thing that Diocletian meant to accomplish, and at the same time completely copied everything that Diocletian meant to do except slap the Christian name on it. So all the persecution of Diocletian got continued and institutionalized into what we call today the Roman Catholic Church. Now I spent my Pauline videos on that. I've, I've, you know, I've, got, I've got documentation on the emperors and stuff like that in here. What I'm trying to show to you at this moment though is Paul is mapping now to verse 6 down here in Matthew 24 so if he's got that kind of precision he's doing in his own text what do you think he's got in mind for Matthew 24 and what do you think the Lord had in mind in Matthew 24 when he writes or says this speech that you know Matthew packages now take a minute and just look at this. I gotta go turn my, I'm cooking. I gotta go turn something. Thank you for letting me take that break. It's Saturday morning and I get to eat hash and that's one of my favorite foods. I'm very uh, plebeian in my tastes sometimes. Okay. Telematos. Hopefully you've had a chance to digest that. Okay. I'm not going to explain the anaphoras right now. It's the, this, is, this occurs three times about God's own delight. It acts like a set of bookends to uh, bracket off important periods of history that Paul is covering by means of his meter. All right? And I'm not going to cover the Apinon anaphora because that's also complicated, but it is in the write-up of Ephesians 1 reparsed. And the PDF version of that is what you're going to need instead if you don't have Bible Works fonts, and that will be in the video description. Okay? It will take you a months to read and vet and think through the material in there. It took me, I, I want to say, a year or two or more just to write the first draft. It's still in first draft phase. Okay, and I started it five years ago. All right, so now, armed with this, knowing that this is 110 AD going down to 127, right? See, because it's 121, so 122, 123, 124, 125, 126, 127, a doxis, glory, okay? So we're going from here to here in the Pauline text, all right? And it's 127 because this was 109 and this is 18. In other words, he's mapping his text to Christ. And the text in Christ is really simple in Matthew 24. There are about to be wars. You're going to hear about that there are about to be wars and rumors of wars. In other words, there's war. My pastor, when he exegeted this, liked to say hot wars and cold wars. Okay? 
Now the period in question, again, is 110 AD to 127. Same thing here, same period. 110 AD to 127. Christ is running three timelines. We're only talking about the version of the timeline that Paul is tagging on. Because there are three different timelines that Christ is using in Matthew 24. I'm only explaining how Paul is tagging one of them. I don't know if I'll live long enough to explain the other timelines. This is just phenomenal text. Okay. They're about to be, you're going to hear that there are about to be wars and rumors of wars. Okay. The text is actually a bit broader than that, but we'll just let it go for right now. Okay, so that means that from 110 AD to 127, the believers, and here he's talking to Jews, and it's really important to know that, you're going to hear about wars, and you're going to be in wars, or they're going to about to be wars. Okay? And then, of course, and we're not in that period, this, this is seven years after that, but, you know, when you hear it, don't get all upset. Just see to it that you don't get upset. Don't be all upset over this. In other words, it's not the end yet. The people say, I'm going to be Christ, so you're going to think it's the end times brother. And oh, brother, don't listen to that. Because the real Jesus Christ is up here. See, so you, Christ. I mean, it's a, it's a sound play in Greek. All right? And here, 110 to 127 A.D., you're going to hear about wars. Yeah. And like four years into it. Starting in, hello, 114. Paul brackets that text. So it's really clear he knows. He's, it, it's clear he knows and the audience he's writing to knows that he's bracketing. Okay. He's bracketing the Matthew 24 text. Okay, see, because look. Melesete. How many syllables is that? Four. At the end, and melesete, melo means about to be. Okay? So melesete means you're, it's about to be. Okay? Oh, wait a minute. My hash is burning. I gotta fix that. Okay, so 114 is the benchmark in Paul. It isn't the benchmark here because it's that there's no clause break. Okay, the closest thing you could say to a clause, if you wanted to break it apart, would be there. Okay, so it'd be melesete de akoen polemus, using 11. Frequent thing in Greek to use 10 or 11 syllables. Melesete da akuen polemus. Okay? 11. That would be where you could break the clause if you wanted to. It doesn't mean anything if you do, so that's why I'm not bothering. 4. That makes it 113, and 114 is right here. Is that clever or what? transitional particle and up here in the upper window highlighted uh, in gray is the 114 total count by the time you get to Eudokion and this is the satire of the highest order baby because Eudokion does mean delight it's got more of a connotation of everything that God wanted accomplished is doing exactly what he wanted it to do it's also got a connotation of um, good news, good report, good idea. It's very closely related to a pinon down here, which almost is always translated good report. I don't think that's really particularly good translation. But anyway, Eudokian means, oh yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. I'm getting it. Oh, but then 114? With the duh down here, 
in context of what's upcoming wars. Now, how is God going to be delighting in that? Well, because God loves the Jews, he wants to protect the Jews, but the Jews are all feisty at this point, and they're all fighting with the Roman Empire and each other, and how do you protect people who are busy doing what they shouldn't be doing? You let them hang themselves with enough rope so that the Jews who are innocent can get out of Jerusalem and scatter into diaspora. Because 114 sometimes called 115, is the beginning of the Kitos War. I don't know Kitos is really the only term for it, but it's basically a set of rebellions that started up in the Anatolian Plateau, you know, around where Ephesus is and um, down in Antioch, okay, and especially, of course, around Jerusalem, in northern Africa, which we call Libya today, they all started rebelling against, you know, Rome. Of course, the temple had been down. It had been another 40 years. They were upset with it. They wanted it rebuilt and all these other things. At this point, Hadrian, who's the emperor, well, no, he's not yet emperor. He's not yet emperor. He is stationed in Syria by Trajan. He's not yet emperor because he becomes emperor right here. He's stationed in Syria and he's sent around sort of round robin to deal with this problem. Now some of it he doesn't handle, some of it like this text so ironically says, you are about to hear about wars and rumors of wars. Well some of it Trajan heard about. Some of it he dealt with because he was in Syria with the garrison in Syria. Okay, but a lot of it was just like, you know, hearing. And he was he was a very energetic guy, really smart guy, and he he had this sort of goal of, you know, Roman supremacy again. He didn't really agree with Trajan's expansion program, but he didn't know he was going to be the heir apparent at this point yet either. And so he's starting to turn anti-Semitic during this time because of the rebels. You know, like we turn angry with the Arabs when they attack us, okay, because they're rebels, as it were. Okay, well, that's kind of how it went for him, too. So, wait a minute. So, Paul benchmarks this because it's a turning point in Hadrian's life, it's also a turning point amongst Christians. Because with all the rebellion going on, one of the big problems that were going on between the Jews and the Christians was that, you know, um, it was kind of like Hatfields and McCoys. You know, who, who's a better who's a better servant of God kind of nonsense. And so there's a, a lot of the Christians were taking advantage of this in order to become more anti-Semitic. Because in those days, you know, if Hadrian's getting that way and Trajan's fighting them, then you can curry favor with the emperor if you turn against the people that the emperor is against. All right, so wars and rumors of wars is not just talking about military engagement. It's talking about almost like civil wars or splits in groups of people. And that's exactly what starts happening during this period, okay? Especially at the word, duh, because that's when the Libyan war breaks out. Isn't that clever? Now, Paul is saying again, as a Christian, if you're in the Word, then you're thinking about God's working everything together for good. <coughs> That's his will. That's his delight to make it work out. That's his will. This is what you should be thinking at the time. But this is what those who are not paying attention to doctrine are going to get caught up in. They're about to be caught up in wars and rumors of wars. And that goes all the way to 127, okay, which, you know, here's 121, 122, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Now, if you're in the doctrine, 
then whatever happens during that time through 127 is going to be glory to you. And if Pinon literally means good report, it's got a lot more meaning in Paul's passage than I can explain right now. But it, mean, it actually ends up meaning that you become the praise of God. You reflect it. That's actually the promise that comes into this passage. You become the praise of His glory means that something, that what He builds in you results in a character and a nature in you, not down here, but after death, that will resound, resoundingly be glorious, okay, of His grace. That you that that, that you're just going to end up being that beautiful, okay? We're bride of Christ. This is what He's doing. Conversely, down here, same period of time, who went 27? You can be about to be caught up in wars and rumors of wars. That's why Christ is saying, "Don't be upset." Paul is essentially elaborating on that before you even get to this part because this is the following seven years leading up to Bar Kokhba. Paul is saying here's your preparation okay just remember you're in his will and that's going to resound to his praise of his glory. Now it sounds real simpering to say it that way you know, because if you walk into church on Sunday and it's all rah rah Jesus, and it might feel good for 20, 30, 50, 100 minutes you're there, and then you walk out and it's the same old, same old. If you actually know Bible doctrine, once you get mature enough in it, you can actually see all this happening in your own life while it occurs. It's not just words where you're supposed to, okay, praise Jesus, all this bad stuff happening to me is really good. It, it, it's not like that. You actually see it come to pass before it comes to pass. You see the meaning he's baptized onto it. And it's so high that you almost want to kill yourself all the time. Now that's Hebrews 12 too. He was happy on the cross. He saw the happiness and the outcome on the cross. And that's talking back to Isaiah 53. What was it? Isaiah 53:11. He will see he will be satisfied. Hebrews 12 is talking back to that. That's what happens to you here and that's what Paul's saying here. Because he's combining all of these anaphoras together as, as a sort of a climactic period. Eudokion, delight. How can you delight in bad times? Telematos, it's his will. And you see what his will is. It's not just, oh, I hope so. This is God's will for my life. I'm sure it will good. Oh, God works everything together for you. know how people are. It's not like that. You actually see the proof of it before you're dead. And that's what turns it into a kind of glory and good report for you while you're here. And then you change once you're dead to actually reflect him. Now, I'm, I'm not sure how much of what I just said makes any sense to you, so use when John and I talk to God about it. But it's just definitely, however you want to understand it at the moment, it's a total contrast to this, to be about to be involved in wars and rumors and wars. Yeah, without doctrine, that's exactly what, you, what you're going to do. You're being at war with yourself, and you're always about to be something, and you never quite make it. Now that's our first little increment on six. I got to cover the history of it in a little more detail in the next increment.